Hey, it's me. I'm back. It's Friday. <laughs> Uno. Uno's back. Hey. Hi, Uno. What a start. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, welcome to Cleveland Browns Daily. Brought to you by BallyBet, now live in Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland. I'm Jason Gibbs from the Cross Country Mortgage Campus here in Berea. Happy Good Friday. We had this conversation earlier, and we're not going to get too religious on the show, but I'm not sure the whole what the good part of Good Friday from a religious standpoint. I don't think it's good. Kind of an interesting weekend in terms of what actually difference. Yeah, yeah, transpires. It's your last day of no no meat. Last Friday. Yeah. much Griff's real excited about that based on earlier <laughs> conversations, too. Uh, so we're, we're happy to be having burgers next Friday in honor of the I, sacrifice that we made for this I, whole Lent season. I understand. I understand. Uh, we're glad you're with us. Coming up today on the program, uh, Kyle Brandt. It is the uh, tradition unlike any other. Breaking down the head coach photo from the NFL's owners meetings. We play it every year. It's one of my favorite things to listen to. I'm selfish like that, and that's why you're going to hear that. Uh, we revisit the Shelby Harris Zadaria Smith re-signing day. Pretty cool moment, pretty great day. Both those guys in studio, you'll hear that. Uh, we have more from Kevin Stefanski at the owners meetings. Uh, part two from the conversation earlier in the week with the head coach of your Cleveland Browns. Uh, in a CBD exclusive, Kelly Russo sits down uh, with Browns running back Naheem Hines. Also uh, a little Dane Brugler before the day is done as well. Uh, I, I believe today might be Bo Bishop's birthday, which is conveniently why he's never here on his birthday. Spending it the right way. But according to the book face, it is his birthday. We should call him. He's in Hawaii. I think it's like six hours. Yeah, he's probably six up. Six hours behind. Eh, what do you, I mean, Bootsy's probably been up for four hours. Yeah. I, he's got to be living the life. I, I know that he has gotten himself into a little trouble. Uh, I know some things have been taken away. Oh, no. Some privileges were taken away this week. Um, but it, it, I think all is well. I think it is going to be a rude awakening on Monday morning. I feel like they should have given themselves another day or two to, uh, if for no other reason, to, to get reacclimated to life on the mainland and, uh, come back. Yeah. The day I came back from Hawaii, like, four or five years ago, like, I didn't do a thing. I think I slept the whole day and didn't want to move because the day is just so taxing, not to mention you lose six hours. Now, and maybe the boys don't have school because it is Dingus Day, um, the, the new holiday post-Easter. There's a chance. I'm not sure how they, this they may They may anyway. not. I don't know. I, I know Olmstead Falls usually doesn't have sc- – I mean, they're on spring break next week, so it's, it's a different – element this year but like in the past they would have monday and tuesday after easter off i don't know if that just gives you a chance to you know get back and get reacclimated and 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 everything like that but um i don't maybe i i would hope for the boy for Bo and uh mrs bishop's sake that uh, they've got a few days to get reacclimated because I think it's going to be quite the challenge to reprogram Bootsy after a week in Maui. Yeah, like your your and your whole time clock's going to be off. He's going to be waking up at four a.m. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a problem. Yeah, I don't know how this goes, but uh, I believe it is the one and only Bo Bishop's birthday. I'd like to. Also comment on one of his let's separate the spring break ideas because Chicago, Illinois needs to institute that. I have saw about 750,000 students inside of Shedd Aquarium <laughs> this week, and it was chaos. <laughs> we need to separate this out. I know that's been Bo's big thing for the last few weeks is let's move spring break and let's have each school go a different time. The Shedd Aquarium was jam-packed with people. 
on, on Monday. Right, so Too many spring breaks happening in Chicago at the same time. I'm coming time. back to you on that. At Bo Bishop, B-E-A-U. What's a Bo Bishop? Bo Bishop, it's his birthday. Flood his Twitter timeline. Wish him happy birthday. Same on the book face, as Bill Belichick likes to say. Uh, all right, back to you, Uno. Uh, in Chicago, had some travel trouble getting home, which – Kind of now worries me that I've actually run into this for the first time. Uh, the last time I was in Florida, it took me a couple of days extra to get back, and I it was essentially flying during the first day of legal tampering. Not ideal. Um, I'm a little concerned about the travel. At this point, I leave this evening. Just get me down to Florida. Just get me down there, and we'll figure it out how to get home. But – uh, I know you had some travel issues, but ended up making it back. How was the week? I didn't realize you were at the Shedd Aquarium. By the way, best aquarium in America. Yeah, so my girlfriend's favorite animal is a beluga whale. So we went last time we were there, and she probably spent two hours just down in the, the whale area watching. We were watching the dolphins. and It's all. crazy. It was So we wanted to do that this time, but there was just so many people in the aquarium this time that it was hard to just sit down there and watch but it's just so cool like how close you can get to the whales yes. and the dolphins and the sea lions were out we did a little sea lion show had them they were like Look at you like domesticated oh yeah quite quite the week for you what was the best thing that you did probably the blackhawks game that we went to blackhawks okay. versus the calgary flames Never been to a. I've never been to an NHL game. I've been to some Cleveland Monsters games, but my first NHL game, which was really cool. Don't really know anything about hockey, but that does not ruin the experience of going. You NHL know, games are pretty awesome yeah, in person. You, you really don't need to know the rules. Is when like when they score a goal, it's crazy. When they make a nice defensive play, it's pretty crazy. Like it's all. It's like a. It felt like a college football game inside of the United Center. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Best food that you ate this week? I want to say it's your place, Kuma's Corner, but it's I'm okay. not sure. The we burgers this, are great. but We went to this pizzeria on the Chicago River. That was fantastic. Giordano's? It was Pizzeria Portofino, right on the river. We got nice reservations. Whoa. Uno, did you make reservations in advance? Uh, so our friends made reservations at this place. The people we stayed with made them. And what was – was it a fancy pizza? It was like, pretty – yeah, it was really fancy. Like, did you have to dress up? Oh, yeah. Uno, what – did did you wear pants? Oh, yeah. Get out I had, here. like, nice nice pants on, nice shirt. Were the shoes tied? Oh, yeah. Get out of here. Well, we did a little walk on the river, and I tied them before we went in the restaurant. Did she so. yell at you? Yeah, so all of her friends yell at me, too. They think it like it's their least favorite thing about me is that I don't tie my shoes. <laughs> so I figured – Uno doesn't done. tie his shoes, for those of you that don't understand that or are just catching up. I mean, he's been here for eight months, and he does not tie his shoes ever. I think I had – I told you you had to tie them when we went to dinner at the Combine. Yeah. Anytime so we went to dinners. Any of our nice dinners, I had them tied. So yes. that was probably the best food. It was fantastic pizza. What would you eat? What kind of pizza? We had a Fresca pizza. It had ricotta cheese, arugula, and prosciutto. And it's – Unlike Hello. any pizza I've ever had, it was fantastic. Nice. A good week. How was your little concert last Friday? By the way, like Zagura had an opportunity to go to that, but his kids were his kids were out of town. Yeah, he missed a, a heck of a show. I mean, she like I was not I was a little worried just because I had heard her last tour wasn't great, and she just knocked it out of the park. She was fantastic. So it, it's funny. Uh, there, there. Are, the powers that be here were like, Sakura mentioned something about you you being at that concert. And the thought was, why is he at that concert? Meaning, you're not a female. Why are you at that concert? Well, <laughs> I will say it was very, like, probably like 85, 15, female to male. And I was like... The girlfriend went. The girlfriend wants to go. Yeah. Like, that's a big deal. Didn't, was, wasn't that a birthday gift or something? It was actually her anniversary gift to me, I think, which is fine. <laughs> her birthday you gift. You like her, too. I, I had wanted to go, but when she says, hey, we're going to Olivia Rodrigo, like, I'm not going to say no. Correct. I do like her as an artist, so I'm not going to, you know, be ashamed by that. But it, it was very much like 
there was a lot of more more women than men and more girls under the age of 15. Yeah. So my my kid, because I brought it up to my, my youngest, uh, and, and she said there's a possibility, like, at a certain time, like, if you matched up time frames, she goes, she might – have been rivaling like Taylor Swift from a popularity standpoint at that age. I would agree. I mean, she's 21 I, years I, old. I don't know about that. She's any more of this. popular at 21 than I think Taylor was at 21. But it's a little like Taylor was in a different genre back then, so it was tough. But I mean, she sold out Nationwide Arena at 21 years old. That's insane. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it was a good week. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. Nice, nice vacation. Not warm. No. But that didn't you know, that's not gonna stop us. Nah. As long as you have some beverages, life is good. Uh let's see. Griff, uh the NCAA tournament last night. Uh UConn, big thirty point win. Although they, they struggled for a little bit to, in the first half, and then they just reminded themselves they're UConn and San Diego State reminded themselves of who they are. Uh the first number one seed goes down. Roll Tide. Alabama takes out the Tar Heels. Bless you, Griff. Hope you feel better. Uh, North Carolina goes down 89-87. Number two seed, Arizona. Uh, Zagura was despondent late last night in the text chain that was going on between Bo, myself, and I told him they NC. were inconsistent. Clemson. But did you, did, did you have Clemson? Well, I had them losing to – I had Arizona losing to Nevada, who lost to Dayton. But so I did not have Arizona going this far. In the I, first, I place. think I did, uh, and I know that I had Carolina like in my finals, which is just that just kills me and eliminates me from anything. However, the Illinois Fighting Illini that would be I L L, if you're listening or watching at home, the Fighting Illini, the three seed out of the East Region. On to the Elite Eight, and they take down number two seeded Iowa State and Cyclones, Illinois. Single handedly, there is one person in our entire office bracket that has the Fighting Illini winning it all, and he is on that side of the glass. Where where is Griff at from a standing standpoint? So in total points, he's in second place. But second, yeah, that means he moved up. Second out of we got over a hundred, I think. How many final fours is he missing? Just he's got one final four gone, which is Carolina, North Carolina. He has Illinois, Houston, and Tennessee. Two of those teams play today. And uh, I would like to, now that my bracket's not worth anything. Uh, go Duke, my Dukies. I would like them to beat Houston today. Uh, I would like to see Tennessee win though. So, there's that. I don't know why you can't sort by max points on CBS, but... I, I, I don't understand the whole setup. He's got the most maximum points remaining of anybody left. It is him with 162 and Hannah Bursick with 161. She's got Marquette. So, those are the two people right now in, in line to win it. So, the other day, we were discussing... NCAA tournament before you went on vacation? I believe, no. Was it the first weekend? Well, so I was here for Thursday and Friday of the round of 64. So Friday, I think we were asking some girl in ticketing <laughs> is leading the bracket. Is that Lexi Norton? Yes. She's on top right now, but she had Carolina. Lexi had 15 of 16 yeah. in the Sweet 16. So her boss comes up to me, he's like, some girl in ticketing, huh? <laughs> and I was like, hey, we clarified. Lexi's crushing it. Yeah, she's in first place right now with 63 points. Yeah. Unfortunately, she lost her champion, but she is doing really well. Absolutely. She's ahead of Griff and Andrew Barry, who are in second and third. Is Griff, Griff still ahead of AB? Yep, one point lead on Let's Andrew Barry. Let's go! Good job, Griff. You can always say if you win this that you beat a general manager That's of an exactly NFL team. That's exactly right. And he's an Ivy League guy. So the Elite Eight is Alabama the four seed versus Clemson the six. Just like we all thought. 
I do like watching Alabama play. I had Alabama they're, beating they're, Carolina, they're so I was excited close. about that. But I thought you just didn't. I thought you said you didn't have any of this. No, I had Bama, not Clemson. But you didn't tell me any of this when I was filling out a bracket. Well, I wasn't going to let you beat me. This was garbage. <laughs> garbage. I I also enjoy watching Alabama. UConn and the Illini. That's a tough one. UConn's playing really, really well. They've won their last, like, nine tournament games by an average margin of 23 points. <laughs> that yeah. doesn't even make sense. No. Um, but I do like I, I do like the way the Illini are playing right now. So, uh, they are hot. I think that's going to be a must-see game tomorrow night. Tonight on the docket, 709 from the South Region. It's number 11, NC State, number 2, Marquette. I feel like NC State can get Marquette. It's going to be if that center, Burns, can – that big boy. Can do anything. Because Marquette's got a guy that can stop him. Like, Oso Igadoro I mean, is good huge. enough, but that guy is big. Yeah. He's got to stay. And Actually, Shaka's not good at winning in the tournament, so. Yeah. Outside of one time. There's that. It, it's not just Burns. It's the two complementary big men. Because Burns only plays like 24 minutes a yeah, game. That other the dude. other two can't fall out like they did in the last game. They can't run out of gas. Like, those two have to have big nights. Uh, to open things up. I'm a little worried that they let the forward from Oakland foul them out, like what they're going to let this guy in Marquette do to them. But, like, they can hang if they just stay out of foul trouble, which I know sounds obvious, but that was their big thing against Oakland that almost cost them. Gonzaga and Purdue tonight. I, I'm almost rooting for the Zags. I think I am too. Um, I, I just – I don't – E.K. versus Edie, though, if you're into big man battling. Fine. The best move Edie has made in his college career is just continuing to stay in school because I don't think he can do much at the NBA level. He might have another year, Zach. If you have it, take it. Yep, I would. Uh, the late games, which is great because I land at like 10 o'clock. Oh, yeah, you'll catch the end of these for sure. It'll just be starting, I feel start, like. yeah. That's I what I'm hoping. I forgot I was like up to 1 a.m. last night watching yeah, these. Yeah, I know. Uh, Duke and Houston? Let's go, Dukies. Come on. Come on. Playing with house money. As I told Uno earlier, they won the first round. They didn't get upset. I thought they might. They got through it, and after that, I'm like, whatever happens after that, I'm all in. Very good guards in this game on both teams. Really excited. Agreed. Uh, the other late game, I think it's going to be an awesome game, Creighton and Tennessee. Yeah. Is it the best game of the night? Probably. If you like offense, I think this is the one. Like I don't know, I don't know if there's gonna be a lot of defense, but if you like scoring, I think Creighton and Tennessee. Like it could be one of those where it's like big shot after big shot from both teams. I'll take it. Yeah, I'm Dalton in for Connect is a baller. Creighton's got the big three. They can all hit shots. I, I'm probably most excited. Of course, that's one right at the same time as the Guardians, but that's okay. Guardians big winners last night. Congratulations to them. One and zero. 161 more to go. World Series is back on in Cleveland. Shane Bieber, back. I kept thinking that Griff was a Rangers fan yesterday. He didn't correct me. I forgot that he's a Rockies fan. I don't – okay, great. Not but great. Mom is a Rangers fan. Rockies suck. 16-1 to one for his your Rockies. Loyalty. Gross. Uh, the Hot Topics of the Day presented by Vivid Seats, an official fan experience partner of your Cleveland Browns. We're 19 minutes in. Let's get right into the OBM Hot Topics. And that is the Cleveland Browns 2024 offseason media schedule has officially been announced. All 32 teams in the National Football League have announced their media schedule. Offseason workouts. The player is going to be back in the building in just a couple of weeks. Two weeks, to be exact. The uh, the 15th, the players start to trickle back in. The 16th begins the voluntary off-season workouts. Uh, and we will hear from head coach Kevin Stefanski and some players that week. Also, uh, on April 18th, uh, which is a Thursday, it is the week before the NFL draft, it'll be Andrew Barry's pre-draft press conference the NFL Draft the following week, the 25th, 26th, and 27th. Exclusive coverage all week long and all weekend here on the University Hospital's Cleveland Browns Radio Network. You get into OTAs uh, and then mandatory minicamp June 11th 
through the 13th. So I'm in Florida the 6th through the 10th. I need that flight to come back on time. Yeah, that's when that's that's mandatory, as it says. And then June 14th is my nephew's wedding, and I'm officiating it. So I don't. It's kind of a busy ten days, uh, but we are going to squeeze in a mandatory veteran mini camp, uh, June 11th through the 13th, and then that's it till training camp at the Greenbrier. Th- this is crazy that we're already at this point. You know, it feels like we were just at the Greenbrier the first time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that doesn't feel that long ago and no. we're already back to this calendar again. Yeah. It, it, it's funny. Well, I and I tell people this thing. like January and February slows down a little bit and catch your breath. And then March, like the ball starts rolling down the hill and it just goes and it gets faster and faster. And now we're into April, May, you're going to have the schedule release and then June mini camp. And then you get six weeks and then. We're back, and it's another season of Cleveland Browns football, which should be pretty darn good given everything uh, that we've got going on here in Berea at the Cross Country Mortgage Campus. All right, that's your uh, Hot Topics of the Day presented by Vivid Seats. Slow day. Coaches are off. No one's really in the building. I, th- I believe next week we, we start getting the interviews uh, for like the top thirty, uh, you know, we we put a, you put a list. Every team puts a list in of players they'd like to do interviews with or meet with at the facility, and I think those start next week. And then the players are back in the building in, within the next two weeks. So it is going to pick up here in Berea. Some exciting times on the way. Coming up next, it's time to break down the annual head coach photo from the NFL's owners' meetings in Florida. No one does it better than Good Morning Football's Kyle Brandt. You'll hear that next. We are live and underway. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Bet, now live in Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Ever thought about hitting a golf ball inside Cleveland Brown Stadium? What goes wrong there? Now's your chance. Thanks to Upper Deck Golf, Friday, June 21st, Saturday, June 22nd. Enjoy a unique VIP golfing experience while hitting tee shots from the Upper Deck. Down to custom greens on the Brown Stadium field below for more info and to book your tee times. Now, they are going fast. I can tell you, I can confirm that the tee times are going fast because it is such a cool event. Uh, UpperDeckGolfing.com. Reserve your tee time today. That is UpperDeckGolfing.com. This conversation, Uno and Griff, happens during the while the first segment's going on. So my, my youngest lives in Paris. She's going to school there. Hey, can my birthday gift from you guys be to go skydiving? I'm not going to tell you what my wife said because I would get the FCC license revoked. Uh, it, she ends it with read your Bible. <laughs> I said, you may not go skydiving. And we had this conversation before she left. I'm like, you may not. And she said, cause, cause she's bungee jumped off a bridge there before. That sounds like a lot of fun. What goes wrong there? <laughs> I know. I know. She wanted to go skydiving. And I was like, there's one rule on this, on this excursion. There is one rule. You may not do this. And I then added, if you would like a birthday gift at all, you will get this thought completely out of your mind because I don't have to give you anything. I'm going to Florida this weekend, and I will spend your birthday money on golf and drinks. That's what I'm going to do. I'm waiting back for a response. Have My brother gone. wants to go skydiving, and I'm all the way out on that idea. I I thought about it at one point. Uh, I had a chance to. There was well, there was going to be a chance to jump out of the plane with the Army Golden Knights. See, that would be that's it. Super I'm a, cool thing. I am attached to a professional. Yes, I am not doing this myself. I'm attached to someone. If it goes bad, eh, I mean, I, I, whatever. I don't need. I've ridden in the F-16. I've I've had a, a fly along and a ride along. I've been in that rocket truck that's got the the fighter jet engine on the back of it, flames everywhere. They didn't even explain what to do if something goes wrong because they go, if something goes wrong, you're dead. So there's that. I don't need to skydive. My kid in another country 100% does not need to go skydiving. We'll see what happens here. I'll keep you posted on how this goes. Right now, it's an annual tradition. It's one of my favorite things to play because it works on TV and it also works on radio. It's the great Kyle Brandt, the last day for Good Morning Football in New York City today. And they're gonna, then they're going to be off for a little while. It's the, it's the breakdown of the head coach photo from the NFL owner meetings. Have a listen. It's here. You're down time. You know, in this business, they say content is king. Everybody's looking for content. This pod, this show, this, 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 that. I love that in 2024, the great content is just one single still photograph of NFL coaches, and it blows up the world. It's here. <laughs> Bring it up right now. The Let's 2024 coaches photo. Everybody dive in at once. First of all, my first reaction, it, it's extremely positive. We've come such a long way. It's so much better produced now. We don't have the guys staring into the surface of the sun. <laughs> I've done this for years, and it, it could be, you know, Doug Marone is standing there just like this, just melting and squinting. Also, I brought this up last year. Someone went around and collected all the lanyards. We got the damn lanyards out of the way. These are coaches. They don't work for, for Dell or Edward Jones. We have some dignity to it. Look, we still have all, all kinds of highlights. Uh, our, our guy, uh, KOC here, is first team all wrinkle. Uh, we got Doug Morono, or I said Doug Morono, Doug Peterson. He's the only guy to be wearing the team logo on the entire thing. He's wearing a Jag shirt. It's a little bit like when the guitarist for the band is wearing the band shirt, and I don't mind that at all. Also, uh, guys, this is the first year we had uh, contest winners be in the picture. I think that's pretty cool. You can't tell me all these guys are head coaches. There's no way. This one does not pass the test. If you go out on the street and say, which one of these guys aren't head coaches? Like, I have no idea who some of these guys are. I feel like they're contest winners who got to be in the photograph. But in a time of change, in a time of everyone not knowing what's up and what's down, you look for someone to be a beacon of solidity, of someone who never changes. 
Give me Coach McDermott. Give me Coach McDermott has found something that works for him. Look at this. This blazer look, which I call piano recital chic, works Ooh. for him every year. You know how it is as an adult sometimes. As an adult man, you just give me just one good blazer and I'll wear it for the next 20 years to every semi-formal event. You want proof? Mc, this is this is his go-to blazer. Give me Sean McDermott over the years. You may not get the consistency you want from the Bills, <laughs> but from coaches, bang, 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 wow. bang. Look at even this year, he wore the same dang shirt. Blazer, 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 blazer. 2025, guarantee it, blazer will be right here. Yes, it looks like he's going to play Frere Jacques oh. at the piano recital or something. But you know what? He's going to the playoffs every year, and he wears that blazer. He just gets it out, puts it on, pairs it with some sort of plaid shirt from L.L. Bean, and he's ready to go. So he's one thing that we can count on. There's a lot of just changes, like though. Just like me. Look at this. I Got might as well done. be him. But next, all right, we got to go. Stay in the state of New York. Actually, it's going out of Jersey. Robert Sala. Let's go to Sala. There's usually one guy who goes like this. All right. Now, Sala appears to have his eyes closed. And I have a take on this. Sometimes there's different versions of the picture. They take five or six and just, you know, in one they happen to be blinking. Yeah. We looked at every single version. He's got his eyes closed in every single no one. Way. Every one. So you know what my take is? He's not blinking. He's closing his eyes on purpose. I think Doug, I, I think, I keep saying Doug Marone. I think Robert Sala is in like a permanent meditative state. Uh -huh. I think he's, he's, he's not blinking, he's meditating. And I, I think he's, he's gonna have to try to get through the season somewhere. He would rather be down here and just solid. It's just like, please, can it just be about football? The best thing that's happened to us in the last nine months was someone sending a new wide receiver a breakfast sandwich. I would never eat that sandwich because it's way too high in saturated fats. And I love it. I do not think he's blinking. Coach, I'm on to you. And if you were Robert Sala, wouldn't you be trying to meditate or breathe or do something like that? Just keep on doing it. Keep those eyes closed. And my God, we can make it about football this year. Robert Sala next. I'm going to give you guys a blind item. I'm going to show just a body part of one of the coaches. And you tell me if you can tell which coach this is. Bring it up. Come on now. Jason, take a wild guess. Oh, that's my guy, Money Mike, Mike McDaniel. That is, that is Coach Mike of the Miami Dolphins, who is cuffed up, who is sockless, who's got his hands folded. He's got the timepiece, not a watch, a timepiece. Oh. And you might say, like, what are you doing, dude? You're a football coach. Guys, he's in South Florida. He's the only one who has it right. Look at this disgusting cuff down here, stuffed in, half in, half out. He's all in, fully committed. Next year will be shorts. He's getting there step by step. <laughs> Give me the wide shot of Mike so we can give him his proper credit. I love that he's on the hot corner. I love he's on the end here. He rolled up specifically so you could see the watch. It's all the things that you like. There's a matching shirt, a matching jacket, matching pants, matching loafers. I don't know how you do the sockless thing in South Florida. It must be disgusting, like clam chowder in there, but who cares? We'll deal with that later. He's only Mike, showing ankle. That's what I'm saying. Oh. He's showing some high ankle with borderline <laughs> shin. We're almost up to the calf. Mike, you always go at it differently. We respect your look. Let's go to the guys now I call uh, Frata Beta Kappa. Let's go, let, let's go to Frata Beta Kappa. Yeah, guys, here we are. Yeah. We're just, we just ran shop at the Beirut table. We did some Dartmouth style pong. Back in the day with the new head coaches, we do atomic sit-ups, but that's frowned upon. I just got back from the Banana Republic outlet. I'm looking good. I'm Jack Shanahan, still in a trance from the Super Bowl. The floor looks great. This is great. I love these guys. Frat Central, so much gel, so much musk. They are, you know, the kind of guys who must go up and do one down south just in case. It's like, these are my uh -oh. kind of guys. You know who they got their eyes on? There's a new recruit they're looking for in Frata Beta Kappa. Go to the other side of the picture. This one blew me away. Did you get a look at Johnny Gannon? Take a look at this dude over here. Hey, Bam! JG, go! Yo! This blew me away. Biceps like crazy, oh. also sockless. Yep. John Gannon is definitely first team all fitness center in the hotel. Like, he was in there when it <laughs> opened. Also... I'm on to you and I respect this about your game. This is a pre-photo pump. You cannot tell me it's not. <laughs> Chris, you know it. He got down and he did the, he did the close grips. He did like the diamond push-ups right down there before he came out. I do it before every segment. I don't blame you at all. But that is definitely a pre-pump. We got to start reconsidering. We like to credit Salah and McDermott for how jacked they are. Gannon, my God, you look good. And it's all business here, too. Mm -hmm. We talk about it all the time. Four wins last year, but they had great wins and they played tough. I like where this team, could, imagine the odds if when the coach's photo came out and said, Jonathan Gannon wins the photo. What? Let's go. That's your Cinderella <laughs> in March. That is your madness. The biceps are crazy. I love them. 
Gannon, who knew? Loafer game. Coming up next. All right, we got to take a sharp left turn here, guys, unfortunately. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Let's go to Coach Mayo. <laughs> Let's go to Coach Mayo for a sec. Now, Mayo eating good, baby. Jason, mm -hmm. <laughs> I know he's carving his own niche, and it's not Belichick. In the fashion sense, it's Belichick. <laughs> All right, I don't know about the football, but, dude, as a first-time head coach, to come out entirely collarless and short sleeve. I mean, this this is the kind of shirt, like, heavy shoulder wrinkles. Who gets wrinkles on the shoulders? <laughs> this is the kind of shirt that, like, like you smell it before you put it on. <laughs> and, you like, you make sure that, like, there might be stains on it. The stains might even be mayo stains. I don't know. But Coach Mayo, I like the look. Right next to Meditative State Sala and Zach Taylor, who people still don't recognize even though he coached the Super Bowl. <laughs> the shirt is tough. I mean, if he had cut these off, they would be even more Belichick. He's going to forge his own identity. That wardrobe ain't happening. Let's go on to, from Coach Mayo. All right, let's go to some of the celebrities here. Give me the Harbaugh boys. Give me the Harbaugh boys. Mm. Right down in front. I mean, John just rock solid. He's been in a thousand of these. I don't love the plaid, but fine, it's his thing. Just give me the chair. <laughs> It, it's you know, there's a, it's been said about Jim Harbaugh, he just can't do anything completely normal. And Jim Harbaugh is here, and he's got all the vibe of like like a fourth grader on school picture day. He's like this, and it's like his mom just licked her hand and adjusted the hair. You know what it feels like when they say, "All right, everybody say cheese." Nobody says cheese. He says cheese. He says cheese, and he's just sitting there like this. And they take the photo, and it comes out a few weeks later, and your mom pays for it, and you get a button and everything. I also don't think it's a coincidence. He's sitting right next to Big Red. Oh, right oh, next oh. to Big Red. He's just saying, listen, don't get too comfortable here. This is Chargers. This is Chiefs. I don't know how they do the seating range, but I've always wanted to know. But the fact that Harbaugh sat his butt down right there next to Big Red, our Jack Nooks in the photo, I don't think is a coincidence. Who's up next? Let's, all right, let's go to Andy Reid while we're at it. Let's just do it. Every single year, I don't know if someone holds the seat for Andy, like there's one of those cutouts of Andy, like at an award show, you know, he sits there, or if everybody just waits. But he sits right down center every time in the Hawaiian shirt. Can we just take a quick tangent? Christ, look at Dave Canales. Talk about it. I knew you were going there. <laughs> now we know what it would look like if Jimmy Garoppolo was the head coach. Bam! That's 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 Canapolo right there. And at some point, can we? I, I know Jimmy's bouncing around a lot. He's with the Rams now. Can we get Jimmy on the Panthers so these two can stand side by side and the TV melts? He looks like a like a racquetball instructor or something. He just looks so fit. But never mind him. That's just a tangent. And ne next to a contest winner, but Andy Reid. And everyone's like, oh, he wears the same shirt every year. How dare you? I've proven this over the year. Bring up the Andy collage. This is everything we got on Andy. Going back to 2017, he's in front of Marvin Lewis. That's how long it gets. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. They're all different. Even when he was in the back row, they've since shown him the respect of being in the front. It works for him. It's the Tommy Bahama Sheik. It's the shirt that you could spill a daiquiri on and no one would know. Or it's even actually better after the daiquiri. Andy Reid, fantastic, where he always belongs, although right next to Harbaugh now. Let's get though back to the upper right corner. This is my favorite section of the whole picture, aside from the Fred about a Kappa. <laughs> Give me the upper right corner. Look at these guys. Ballhead crew. Bung, bung, <laughs> bung. This looks like cell phone bars. Like you got strong reception oh, going on down here. Ding, ding, yeah, I got one bar. No, I got three bars, you can make a call. Uh, it's also like the uh, Rus Russian nesting dolls. They're like Russian coaching dolls. If Russian dolls were bald and didn't win any playoff games last year, that would just be right there. Incredible. This is a wow. great, great section. That's true. Look, at it's like you can do like the NBC chime. Bong, bong, bong. I love those guys. It's like they could not have arranged it better. Big, medium, small. I love my favorite section. But also, we always have this mysterious chapter in the breakdown where... There's guys not there. Belichick used to rarely show up. He would show up like once every several years, like a comet or something, he'd be there. This year we got all kinds of guys not there. Bring them up. McCarthy, Flus, Sirianni loves himself. He's a big fan of Sirianni. Why would you not be in the picture? And then we got Tomlin and Peyton. I got a theory on these two. I think they were walking over to the picture, they're chit-chatting. And this guy put a hand on this guy and said, you and me, we're going to go for a walk. You and me are going to talk Russ for a Figure while, okay? Out. Tell me, what's the deal with Russ? Like, oh, I, I love Russ. Just shut up. Stop lying to me. I, I just had my first time here. Tell me the deal. And these two guys are walking on the beach, and they're debating Russ Wilson because this guy couldn't wait to not coach him. And this guy just said, I want to coach him. I do like, you know who's got a cool look in his face? I know it's last year's picture, but I think he has the same look. Where's my guy? Where's my guy? There. Give me the flus. Matt Eberflus, ladies and gentlemen, this is the longest we've ever talked about him on the show, but he is not there. And you know what else I like in the GM photo that they do? 
Ryan Poles was not there either. Oh. These guys are working. working. They got a new quarterback coming to town. They got a nine pick. I don't even care about the fashion. Pete Carroll, by the way, we miss you in the picture. Yeah. You were there for decades. Eberflus smile. I don't know what the hell he's not doing there. He's not doing there in the NFC East. I like that look on Eberflus. I like that business poll. Sort of mysterious. We run the draft. We are the guys in control. These two, we know what they're talking about. But that's it. Five coaches missing. We got wrinkled shirts. We got traps. We got meditating. We got fraternities. We got rolled up cuffs. Guys, let's go back to the main picture. Is there anything that I missed? Jason, I know you want in your Mr. Fashion. I think with Mayo, that's a Patriots shirt. He has on team gear as well. It's just inside out. You said you pick it up. You smell there was a stain on the front side flip it around just go with the all navy the t-shirt and it works i gotta give love you said john gannon yeah absolutely right fashionable guy fitless he is worthy of it you can tell by the loafers if he stands up those pants are going to be perfectly tailored <laughs> you're all right way down to the t also dennis allen only coach in the photo with a hat on don't know where that is, but he has the hat on. The, my favorite comment is the contest winners. I thought you were going to go into the all-time. You were going to rank the contest winners, how they got there, and their background story. When well, you know you're in a confessional, and you say, like, hey, I submitted my yes. video, and I did this. I'm a big fan. I'm for. Unbelievable. I love it. Thank you. Sarah. So I have a question. Yeah. And maybe this is a stupid question, but you alluded to it. Is there really a seating chart? Is someone is somebody going know. out there? Now, it, it makes me think that there is when you did the height when we went from Sala to Quinn sure. to Dayball that somebody set that up that yeah. way. But Andy's always in the middle. I mean, I, I need to know this. Is someone down there arranging it? Do they all get to they sit with their friends? Do I they... like to do it by, by tenure. You know, so Andy Reid is here. If that's the case, I don't know what the hell Canales is doing here. Harbaugh's been away for a long time. This should be John Harbaugh should be moved over. Yeah. Tomlin's not Tom in the Lynn picture, so he can't there, be yeah. here. I Listen, I've offered for years to go down there. I want to do red carpet arrivals. <laughs> and, like, I want to ask, you know. Uh, how many curls? I want to ask Raheem Mostert, like, who are you wearing? But how, we know how many curls he did. Arm day was not ready for coach. He did them all. He had those adjustable dumbbells. He had them all the way up. Hogan, get in here. By the way. How about the miracle of this thing? No mention of Dan Campbell. I, All I can say, he's got alpha vibes. He's got a Dan Campbell shirt. shirt. He looks great. How many great. cups of coffee did he have before? A lot. Show. A lot. <laughs> Especially some of that special, like uh, that French press coffee. He probably <laughs> absolutely loves it. The can man is right there looking great. Some guys just sit there and do nothing. Jim Harbaugh's incapable of being boring. Some guys just sit there and do nothing. Anything else, Hogan? I mean, you got to mention McDermott's dunks that he has on, too. With, I know he's, he rocks the same top. Yes. But you know, two games. Two games. Not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna split games. hairs and, and say that he goes all navy here and goes with the black shoes. I, I'm gonna give Coach credit. Lives in Western New York. Yeah. He's a meat and potatoes type of guy. <laughs> I like the Blazers. Same time. He also has this giant ass digital watch he wears every year. <laughs> Sean McDermott is a character and a creature of habit, and we respect it. Uh, guys, that's the that's the picture this it. year. We have the uh, Dairy Queen style uh, landscaping here. We have a whole fleet of black SUVs gassed up to take the coaches to God knows where. Yeah. And one more time, Robert Sella. And Robert Sella, everything's zen, and yes. God bless him. My God, he's Antonio an idiot Pierce this year. got the taco meat out too. I love that <laughs> taco. He's got a, he's got a couple different God. gold chains. He looks good. He's he, hey, Antonio Pierce looks normal. I, I, I got baby. nothing to say about him. That's it. You're up next year. Best photograph of the year. Pretty darn good job by the league this year. Cleaning it up a little bit. Although we are missing five coaches. Yeah, it seems Kinda like sucks. every year there's people that they leave out. I don't know how you miss the photo. I, I, I don't know. It's the it's the owners' meetings and your families are down there. I get it. Everybody everybody brings their family down. So, I I don't know what that looks like or what happened, but somehow five coaches don't end up being in it. But a great breakdown. It's a legendary breakdown by the great Kyle Brandt. Uh, it was a kind of an emotional morning for him. Good morning football, of course, the last day in New York City. They're moving to L.A., and they're going to be off for a couple months. They're not going to come back really till football starts again. So uh, kind of rebranding and doing some stuff. But it, it sounds like he's going to be around and going to be a part of it and uh, whatever it looks like. Looking forward to seeing it and uh, appreciate his, uh, his efforts because they're always legendary. All right, when we come back from this quick timeout, in a quick couple minutes, and we're going to be right back. Uh, we're going to take you back a few weeks. The highlight of NFL free agency for your Cleveland Browns outside of the acquisition of Jerry Judy uh, would be the re-signing uh, of Zadaria Smith and Shelby Harris. Why? Because their interview was epic. It was in studio. It was with Zagura, and we will hear that interview next when Cleveland Browns Daily continues. Brought to you by Bally Betts on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
All right, coming up in Hour 2, you'll hear from head coach Kevin Stefanski from the owners' meetings in Florida. Uh, Kelsey Russo, our senior staff writer, sits down with Browns running back Naheem Hines in a CBD exclusive. We'll also hear from draft analyst Dane Brugler, the great Dane Brugler, uh, whose draft guide should be coming out later next week, knock on wood. Usually comes out the first week in April. Looking forward to having the beast out. Looking forward to having him back with us as we get closer to the 2024 NFL Draft, April 25th, 26th, and 27th. I'm Jason Gibbs here from the Cross Country Mortgage Campus in Berea. Time to hear from uh, two gentlemen that decided to come back and play on the defensive line for your Cleveland Browns. It was a fantastic afternoon here in Berea and in the CBD studios when Shelby Harris and Zadarius Smith joined our own Nathan Zagura. Have a listen and have a watch. So you guys are like, had fun last year? Let's run it back, right? That's what it was? Definitely. Yes, had to sir. get the gang back together. You already know. Yeah. yeah. And think about Zadarius in your room. I mean, it is literally the gang back together. Miles, yes, you, Alex, yep. Obo, Isaac, yep. Isaiah. I mean, you got Isaiah. the whole crew back together. Yeah. Is, have you had that before where you've gone like five straight guys back to back seasons? Uh, I never had that in my career of football. Nope. Never had it. So this is gonna be something special to running back like this. And I saw you yeah. seeing Mo down there and so oh, yeah, yeah. you and Mo and Siaki and Dalvin bringing yeah, that man. back as well. Yeah. It, was that something that was important to you? Yeah, you know, just uh to be with the same guys that we had last year. We all had a real good chemistry and you know, we play really well off each other. So it was just it was really important to be with these guys. Yeah. When you guys go into a situation like this, it mm-hmm. could be potentially free agency again. Yeah. You guys said, no, before, we're going we're gonna to come back to Cleveland. What was kind of the deciding factor for, for either of you? I feel like because it was the start of something special, you know, um, to get as far as we did this past year. You know, we had a lot of injuries. Yeah. And still made it to the playoffs, <laughs> man. So that's how you know this team is special. And I just want to continue to, you know, finish my career and play the rest of my years here in Cleveland. Yeah, I just that. think I just think that – it's just uh, you don't get these type of locker rooms mm-hmm. very often in the league where right. everybody's cool, everybody gets along, every, everyone's like brothers. And so, you know, even with all the injuries and stuff, how successful we were last year, uh, you know, you can't turn down an opportunity to be back with this group. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, when you enjoy going to work every day and, you know, you enjoy being around the people that you work with every day, you know, it's – uh, <laughs> Man, I st- yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, and even no matter how annoying <laughs> and any of the dudes may be, but you know, at the end of the day, like it, that's that's important. Like yes, it, it you know, it just uh, it makes your life a lot easier, a lot happier when mm-hmm. you enjoy what Come you're away. doing and who you're doing it with. Yeah. Well, I can tell the people who are – they didn't get the the privilege of, of hearing you guys banter back and forth for about 10 minutes before we started this, but you guys clearly enjoy being together, and it sounds yes, like sir. there's a good give and take, a little friendly banter, uh, some yes, jousting. Man, I didn't miss him at all, man. You know what I mean? Like, he, <laughs> he, he over here be bothering me over here, not answering nobody's phone calls and stuff. That's you know. No, so it's crazy. He called me. I actually changed my number because <laughs> I always change my number, I think, every two years. But um, he was trying to call me, couldn't get in touch with me, so he hit me up on Instagram. Like, hey, Z, where you at? I thought we was taking a D-line trip. Yeah, we were supposed to, but of course, nobody ever want to show up to anything, so. Well, you know who have to pay for that, right? Miles Garrett. The DPOY. Miles Garrett. DPOY. That's right. He's paying for the trip. The reigning sure. defensive player of the year, no yes, doubt. Sir. Exactly. Why not? He's doing He's doing just fine for exactly. himself. Yeah, he's doing yeah. fine for himself. Speaking of pay. trips, you guys got anything coming up? Please don't act Shelby. Uh, <laughs> but for myself, but for myself, I got a chance to take my family to uh, Cancun, uh, nice. Mexico. Um, it was something, you know, quick and short, because um, my family, you know, they ain't want to be gone from home too long. But I think that was one of my trips, and I'm also go to Tokyo. Oh, really? Uh, Tokyo. Yes, sir. Have you ever been before? Never been. Never been. What's no. the What's the draw to you? I want to go Tokyo too. I think Japan seems fascinating. Man, I just always see videos of the people um, on the Mario Karts. What is it? <laughs> Mario Karts? Like, yeah, like the small Mario Karts downtown. Where they're rolling around? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> you might be I, too big. You I might be no too clue. big. The big Z might be I'm too big about, for hey, one of those. That's cars. just no a kid clue. in me. I just want yeah. to try it out. But, uh, nah. That's a long. By the way, that's a long flight to go to get in a go kart. I'm just saying. Once this air, once this air, everybody will know exactly what I'm talking about. But Mario Kart. I'm done. Nah. But all seriousness, man, just to take my family somewhere. I actually got my son, my oldest son right now. He's 10. Okay. So 
for him to be able to experience that is going to be big. So yeah, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Be just awesome. Can't wait to do that. I know Shelby's got big plans telling everybody about it. Um, well, you know, I'm audience. not telling everyone. Everyone keeps asking me. That's what I heard. Me, uh, it's just what we heard. Everyone keeps about asking me, and so minutes. I'm not going to lie. But you know, just <laughs> ten minutes. You know, but you know, we uh, we got a big you know spring break. All these all these kids. We got four kids, and we're two different spring breaks to a week after each other. So the first week we're going to Honduras, going to Rotan for. Uh, my oldest is spring break, and it's like a big family trip. My in-laws are going. My brother-in-law oh, nice. is going. So it'll be nice. Uh, we haven't done that in a couple of years. You know, the in-laws are getting older. got to enjoy every minute, you know, that you have with them. With the family. And then the next week after that, we're going to Cancun, um, and we'll be there for a week. Following in the footsteps. Yeah, we'll be in Cancun for a week. But then the next month in April, I got a wedding. I got to go to Cabo, And then supposedly, maybe for my anniversary, we're going to Ibiza. Oh wow! So out of all the trips, he never mentioned the D line trip. Yeah, because sounds like he's pretty well booked here. Yeah, to be well, honest with you. Like hey, I can always make out. time for a D line trip. It's just you know the powers that be need to make the decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to get on the phone with Miles. I feel and Alvin. Like, yeah, yeah. What, Mister International? Aren't you guys the most senior guys? Yeah, yeah but you know it's so a, that, it's, to me that there's some respect that comes five. with that, right? It's like hey, look, a core I got five three kids. Okay, I have three kids. He has four. No, no, you guys are answering to. <laughs> different different masters. Right? You, guys, you, guys have, you guys have different things that you're dealing you know, with there, negotiating. Yeah, Dave and Noah and Miles have kids, so yeah, right, they so can they spread, should be, spread the wealth. Well, the, from my standpoint, somebody who also has kids, then it feels like you guys say, hey, here's when we're available. Right. Make because you're always available. <laughs> I like yeah, it. It's called make it work. Make right. It work. These yeah. are our dates. Make yeah. it work. Ma- hey, it, we exactly. still have time. As long as we get this trip done before the start of next season, it still counts. It's, it's it like, still counts. It still I counts. Like yeah, it. no I doubt. Like no it. doubt. Like it. When you think back on last season, you mentioned all the injuries, mm-hmm. just kind of the wild scene. And I'll never forget Thursday night against the Jets after we went doing the laps around the stadium oh, yeah. with all the fans. Yeah, man. When you think back on it, obviously it didn't end the way that you guys wanted it to end. I mean, mm-hmm. it only ends the way one team wants it to end ultimately in the National Football League. But was this a pretty special season and, and Cleveland Browns, just like Baltimore, Joe Flacco yeah. with the Baltimore Ravens? To just feel that kind of love, was that a special night for you guys in your career as well? Yeah, I feel like it was for me um, because I can say I've been in this situation, what, six times now to be able to make it to the playoffs yeah. and just get an opportunity. And going, being in Baltimore, you know, getting ready to play Cleveland, I'm like, okay, we're about to play Cleveland. Yeah, we're going, this is a stat game, you know. <laughs> and to come here is really not like that anymore, you know. Um, we're taking advantage of every opportunity and – like I said, it's the start of something special. And it's only going to get bigger from here. Absolutely. I, I just think it was just to be a part of something with this fan base. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everyone's always heard about how crappy the Browns have been. Let's just be honest about it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Not know, anymore. No. Well, no, and that's no, the fair. thing, though. To be a part of that, you know, the, like the changing of the guard, to be a part of, uh, you know, this new Browns era that's coming mm-hmm. in, that's what was cool about it. You know what I mean? Because – even before the season, like when I got here, nobody expected anything of us. Then the minute that Deshaun went down, nobody expected anything of right. us. Well, you know, Chubbs, Deshaun, like every every injury that would happen, everyone would be like, oh, they're done. They're done. Count them out. And Each all we and kept doing week, was just kept responding, every, yep. you know, every week. So, you know, that's what made it special. And then, you know, just to have the support of, of, of the, the fan base, you know, yeah. and then that last game you said, you know, against the Jets, like, I've never been a part of anything like that. You know what I mean? Where, like, well, after the game, you know, you're going around high-fiving everybody, yeah, just, man. like, hanging out with the fans, like, as a pro. Sure. That's like a college atmosphere. It was like a senior night in college, Yeah, you right? know what I mean? So <laughs> it was just, uh, it, it was real special to be a part of something like that and just, uh, and to sign back here and to be a part of mm-hmm. the growth of the Cleveland Browns and to be yep. able to say, like, you know, we're helping, you know, the ascending Browns, you know, t- take the next step. Obviously, I'm biased at working with this organization for so long, but these fans are special would you guys mm-hmm. you guys have played in some great environments obviously yeah. in the past with great fan bases but do you feel there is something special about this city and when you win yes. in this city yes yes yeah, it 100%. is man i was on a flight last night and uh they put me right there in the front i don't know why they put me right there in the front seat well, that's uh, typically a good seat yeah 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 <laughs> to be fair, but a lot of people would change it was just <laughs> everybody that got on the plane you know after me was just hey Zedarius, thank you thank you thank you thank you kids you know at the age of six seven oh, yeah. getting out of their seat while the plane is in the air can i take a picture with you and i'm like man don't you supposed to be sitting down <laughs> but it's just like the fan base man a lot of people here, man, are really truly loving the Browns, man. And that's why I'm so happy to, to sign back here now. You guys are both family men. You have kids, yes, as you talked about earlier. 
and you talked about also, rightfully so, for a while it was a struggle here, to be mm-hmm. perfectly fair. So there was a generation of kids, and thus fathers with their kids and mothers with their kids, mm-hmm. who didn't get to root for a winner. Right. And you guys have yeah. brought something very special to for this sure. city, yeah. and it's bringing generations of kids back. For yeah. a while, it's like, who wants to root for a team that yeah. didn't win a game, right? I mean, that's a hard, it's a little bit of a hard mm-hmm. sell. Right. And now to see that, and you're talking about six and seven year olds wanting to come take pitches, that's. Yeah. That's an exciting thing, and you guys are certainly a part of something very special in that regard. Man, yeah. my neighbors. <laughs> like, I'm talking about, I think about it like this, like, my whole neighborhood has, like, 50 kids in it. And it's just, like, the excitement that the team brings to the community. The exci- like, everyone, you know, you can talk about the Cavs, you can talk about all other teams, but, you know, you can tell they're just it's waiting. They're waiting for the Browns to pop. Yeah. That's right. You know what I mean? And it's just, uh, you know, to see how excited that, you know, families and everyone are getting, like, when we do good, it just, it's a motivation, you know, to do better. And, and yeah, like, I got to say, it is one of the better fan bases, that, like, in the league because they've been bad for so long and they're still yeah. here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm from Milwaukee, so I grew up a Packer fan. But my whole life growing up, we were good. Yeah. So I only can imagine yeah. if it was the other way around and the Packers were terrible and then they finally got good and I was a fan. So, you know, we like I feel like you know the whole locker room embraces it, and you know we we become one with the community. Yeah, and I can say this too. When I was telling you about the guys who was coming on the airplane, there was one man. He was ninety years old. I forgot his name, but hopefully he watches and see it. And he was just telling me how excited he'd be on Sundays just to wait for the Browns to come on and play. He said that was his first time ever feeling that way. So that was special to hear yeah. that from him, a guy that's ninety years old, man. Mm-hmm. Well, we've got to get it. We got to yeah. get it done for him this yeah, year, right? We got to get it. To. So we talked about coming back. You love the locker room, mm-hmm. love the continuity, and yeah. the group of guys you're with. In your room, one change though, obviously, mm-hmm. defensive line coach Jacques Cizere, who played in the league for a long, long time, was with mm-hmm. Houston last year. How's that? Obviously, no Oboe and some right. of the guys down there. How's kind of your introduction? I guess talking to him down there into the cafe. Oh, man, it was great. Um, I can relate to him because you know he played what nine, ten years. Yeah, and then I'm going into year ten. So man. That's, you know, Is that wild to reflect? No, you know, man. No, I'm not getting you know, old. Don't wow. say that. But, uh, <laughs> but now nah, it's a blessing because a lot of people don't get the opportunity to make it this far, man. And, and just to have a coach that played that long, man, to understand the game. And when something may go wrong in the game, he'll be able to see it before I see it. So just to have a guy like that in the building, where he came from was Texans. He yep. produced, helped produce a lot of guys. Um, Anderson, played well, yeah. Grenard, 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 Grenard just went to Minnesota. Barnett played well Come with them on, last man. year. So, there. so we getting something special, man. You thought you saw something last year. Shh. Wait till you see this D line this mm-hmm. year. By the way, ten years of league, not a gray hair. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> no is, is, that, is that supposed to be a shot? Or something <laughs> like that? Shelby. Because, because I, look at Shelby. Listen, don't Shelby. let the frost on the roof fool you. No, I say I this. Because I'm going into year 11, and I say this. Give him one more year. <laughs> one, one more year. year. Give That's him one difference. more year. Give, give him one more year, and he's going to get these grays in the beard just like I do. <laughs> no, don't wish that on me. Don't wish that on me. No, Guys, sir. congratulations. I'm sure, you know, going into free agency probably could be somewhat, where am I going to end up? What's it going to be like with families? All of that to be able to. Come back, know that they wanted you back right away. Yeah. You wanted to come back. It's awesome. So welcome yes, back. Man. Congrats, and looking Appreciate forward to a big season after thank all of your so adventures much. around the world, especially yours. Oh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. Shelby. All right, for Zadari Smith, Shelby Harris, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back with more Clean Browns Daily right after this.
Welcome back to Hour 2 here on a special Good Friday edition of Cleveland Browns Daily, presented by Valley Bet, now live in Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland. I'm Jason Gibbs. The boys are back on Monday. Happy birthday to the great Bo Bishop. I believe it is his birthday. He quietly walks off and disappears during his birthday. And according to the book face, it's his birthday. So shout him out at X, at Bo Bishop, Bo Bishop on Facebook. Shower him with praise and love as he spends, I, I'm assuming today's the last day in Hawaii since it's got to be like a 14-hour excursion back home. Yeah, you need to give yourself I feel like they got to come back, back tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. I, but who knows? He's Sunday supposed to be, to be sleep all day. Correct. He's supposed to be back on Monday. Zagura back on Monday. Uh, and the band back together on Monday. We hope you have a great Easter weekend. Now, coming up this hour, special CBD one-on-one with Kelsey Russo, our staff writer, and new Browns running back Naheem Hines. Also going to hear from Dane Brugler. Right now, though, from earlier this week in Florida at the NFL's owners' meetings and the head coach breakfast. We played part one of uh, Kevin Stefanski's little meeting with the media earlier this week. Here are some highlights that we didn't get to from earlier in the week. Wanted to get these to you. Some quick hitters on this Friday. Have a listen. I think it's always... If you can keep everybody you want to, like I, I say every year, that's sometimes it's not the reality. But uh, there were cases, like you mentioned, that we were able to bring guys back. And I think the advantage of that is they, they know how we operate. They know our program. They know what we're about. We know what they're about. So those are guys that, that fit our culture. They obviously fit our team and our scheme. Uh, so excited about that. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Uh, Ken and I flew out there, spent 24 hours in L.A., went out to dinner with Deshaun. Uh, he's in a great place uh, physically. It's beautiful out there, uh, but he's, he's doing a great job with his rehab. So really it was more of a me checking in, you know, catching up with him, and then starting to develop a relationship with Ken uh, was really the most important part. He's right where he needs to be. Uh, he's, he is, has started throwing. Joe Sheehan, our trainer, went out and, and supervised some of his throwing. So we'll see him in April uh, when he gets back in, and, and we'll just continue that rehab. As you know, Mary Kay, I'll, 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 let, I'll stay out of it and let the doctors and the trainers and, and, and that type of thing, they'll, they'll, they'll tell me when he's ready, but I know he's, he's doing a great job. He's right where he needs to be. Since you added Ken Dorsey, you consistently said he's got a we want to put this offense together again. Yeah. We finished tenth in scoring. I mean, should, should, uh, would it be more accurate to say put Watson together again? I think for me, whenever you're talking about different coaches and, and adding them into into the room, I just think back. I just think to our offensive meeting room. I've been so impressed with Ken and the entire offensive staff. Uh, as you every year, you pull it apart and you put it back together. So it's, it really is a construction. Uh, that, that you're doing year to year. So Ken's been at the forefront of it. Uh, and, and so much of it is making sure that we're doing everything that fits our guys. So obviously the quarterback plays into that, uh, of, of course. Uh, but I think Ken and the entire offensive staff have been working really hard. And we're still not there. We still have a couple weeks till the players get here. But we're, we're in constant mode of trying to put that thing back together. Andy, kick it over that offensive line yep. coaching role. Yep. Similarities, differences, and you know how do you, with what Bill was teaching, Sure. You know, how, how do you sort of meld that in? Yeah, I think Andy understands, you know, you don't go into that job, you try and be Bill Callahan. Andy's worked for Bill before at, at the Jets, so understands that. I think Andy's really, really good schematically, really good technically, good with the players. So he's got to do, he has to uh, run that room and, and, and make leave his mark in his own way. Now, there's plenty of things that will have carryover. And, of, of course, there's cer- certain things that will adjust in, in how we're doing. Uh, but those will be nuanced. Yeah, you guys have decided to play a lot of games or a lot of games. With all the turmoil that position came out the last couple of years, you have 60-plus quarterbacks in your play. How does that inform the way you approach that and stock up the position? Yeah, you know, we, 
we really think it's important to have a bunch of guys. Uh, obviously, your, your goal is to have your starter healthy for all 17 games and beyond. That, that's every, every team's goal. Uh, but you, we know that that, uh, that is a position that's important for the football team, both in the meeting room, on the practice field, around the locker room. So we uh, feel like adding good players is a good thing at that position. Kevin, with, with Huntley, was there any surprise? Like, we went through the first wave of free agency, and he's there. Right. So did you guys kind of circle back and talk about him? Yeah, uh, we've competed against him, so he's somebody that certainly was on our radar. We know what type of player he is, so uh, when he was available at, at, in that time that he was available, we felt like it was a really good fit. He's a very uh, good route runner, can win with at, at every level, can win at the second level of separation, good with the ball in his hands. I think he's a, a player, his skill set, and you saw this when he was coming out, Mary Kay, uh, was a player that could take the ball and could go. I mean, he has the, the speed, the acceleration, the burst uh, to make plays down the field. So we're excited about the skill set. We're excited about the person. Where did it come down on this hybrid kickoff? Do you like it? Does Bubba like it? It's interesting. Uh, I, I think all 32 clubs are going to be figuring it out as it goes, which means it's not an advantage to anybody. So uh, I have the same questions that I'm sure everybody has. W what do the returners on this play look like? Are they more punt returner, shifty guys? Is it more of a kick returner, one cut run? <laughs> the guys on the kickoff team, do you, do you need more length? Is it, is it bigger bodies as opposed to speed like before? I don't think anybody knows that. I think that's, that's the exciting part for us as coaches is to get on the board and, and talk about it. Obviously Bubba and I have been spending a lot of time on it already uh, in anticipation of it passing. Uh, and then, it, then how it factors into your roster construction, all those type of things. So I think everyone, uh, if it passes, will, will be working that out on the fly. Is he in favor of it? I think we're in favor of, certainly we want to keep the foot in the game. Uh, we're in favor of the, the play. How, what everybody decides on, what the exact proposal is, we'll work through that today, I believe. Uh, but we're certainly in favor of adding an exciting play to our game. Coach, what would you say is uh, the most important factor developing a young quarterback? Is there one thing that stands out? There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think with, with young quarterbacks like any young player, I think if you're going to develop them, you better have a good relationship with them. So I think building a, a relationship of trust is important because it, it's a hard position. You're going to ask a lot of them. Uh, you're going to ask a lot of them in the meeting room, at the line of scrimmage, before the snap, after the snap. So. Uh, before you can ask all of that, I think you have to have a great relationship with that person. Probably so that's where it starts. All right, that's our head coach, Kevin Stefanski, live from the NFL's owner meetings in Florida. Been a busy week down there. The rest of the coaching staff's gotten the week off. Everybody's back next week. And uh, April 15th, players report for the voluntary offseason program. Just a few weeks away, and we'll get it going here for the 2024 season. Hard to believe. Coming up after this quick timeout, it's a CBD exclusive as our staff writer, Kelsey Russo, sits down with new Browns running back, Naheem Hines. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Bet now live in Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
All right, welcome back here to Cleveland Browns Daily, a special Good Friday edition of the program. Hope you and yours have a fantastic holiday weekend. The weather's starting to turn, starting to get a little bit better. Baby steps, but it's getting there as we get ready for the month of April. And one of our new additions, Naheem Hines, uh, he made a big impression with us here in the Cleveland Browns Daily Studio. He also had a chance to sit down with our staff writer, Kelsey Russo, for an exclusive backstage pass. Have a watch and have a listen. Welcome to Cleveland. How has your first couple days been with the team so far? Uh, it's been great. Got to do rehab here, uh, meet the training staff, got some work in with Larry. I, I, it feels like home already. I really do like it. Uh, of all the Midwest cities I've been in, I feel like I, I saw the Jacks, I saw uh, Canes. I think I'm really liking it here, so I'm excited to be here. Getting to know those guys early on, why is that so important to you, especially as you get acclimated to the team? Well, one, just coming back from an injury. Got to, I know I'm going to lean on those guys, need those guys, and all football players know you're going to be with the training staff and strength staff, and uh, honestly, them more than your coaches. So uh, those are people that, like, you know, are the building blocks of a football team. Those are people we spend a lot of time with, and I know that I, personally I'm going to need them, and we all need them to get healthy or stay strong to do what we need to do to win the AFC North and contend in the playoffs. What went into your decision to sign with the Browns? Probably familiarity. I, I had some success with Bubba and Indy. Knew uh, Ken Dorsey really well. And then uh, just the fit. I think both sides saw that there's a fit here. It's a perfect fit uh, in the return game, uh, having some opportunities on offense in the passing game to make some big plays. And I think that's really what led into it. What were those conversations like with Andrew, with Kevin, as you got to, got to know them and really showcase you, who you are to them? It was just kind of like I said the first time, like uh, A.B. and uh, Kevin, they just said I was a perfect fit here. I saw that like they had a need for somebody with my skill set, uh, somebody who can catch the ball in the backfield, uh, go on the slot, and as a kick and punt returner. So uh, I feel like this is a place where I'm needed and wanted, and that's where home is. Going back to you said knowing Bubba from the Colts, when you look at your time with the Colts, what do you take away from those first four years? It was a great time. I had a good time with Bubba, a great time, great learning experience, played with a bunch of different quarterbacks, had ups and downs, made the playoffs, missed the playoffs, needed to win one of the last two games to get in the playoffs, lost both of them. So I feel like I've had a full career, except for you know getting to the AFC Championship and going to the Super Bowl, in which I want to do, and I think this team is good enough to do it. Cleveland has a great defense, so as a punt returner, I'm excited. Hope we have a lot of three and outs. I'm really excited to be a part of this culture. It's a very blue-collar, hard-working city. I've seen a lot about Cleveland, heard a lot about the dog pound. It's a really good fan base. You know, when you were with the Colts, you established yourself as a pass-catching threat out of the backfield. Why was that so important for you to establish that, and what about your versatility in this game can be really beneficial for you? I think uh, just I've always had that skill set, when, even when I play running back in Elementary school, high school, college, I always played slot. My dad always did it. And uh, I genuinely believe I'm one of the best at what I do. And uh, there's not many dual returners in the league to begin with. You only do kick and punt return. And then I also can catch the ball well and run in between the tackles. So I think I can kind of do everything. But uh, got to come out here and earn it. Uh, Nick Chubb's here. I'm excited to play with him. Uh, Jerome Ford. There's, there's some good players here that I've seen over the years. So uh, I'm just going to get in where I fit in. But I think I'm one of the best at what I do. And I'm looking forward to getting back and proving it. Speaking of Nick and Jerome, when you look at this running back room, obviously Nick's coming back from an injury, but how do you think you can complement them and how you guys can improve the run game this coming season? It's like thunder or lightning. Like both of those guys are obviously bigger than me. They pound, they're, they're pounders, they run hard, both of them. Uh, Nick's a dog, we all know how Nick is, and Jerome, he was, he had, he's had he been really good in Nick's absence. So uh, for me, I think they, they're going to do a lot of the banging, and after they do all that banging, the guys have to come chase me. So uh, I think it'll be a little bit of thunder and lightning. Uh, I'm not scared to stick my nose in there too, but uh, I'm really excited just to compliment these guys. I think I'm a little bit different than both those guys, and I think uh, they check some of the boxes that I don't check, and I'll check some of the boxes that they don't check, and I think that's what will make us really great. You touched on it a little bit, but you know Ken Dorsey now being here as offensive coordinator, he was in Buffalo when you were there. That familiarity, what, why is that so helpful for you as you make this transition to the Browns, knowing that he is the offensive coordinator here? Well, I think first off, uh, he just knows the guy I am. He knows that I, I know I'll be a great locker room guy. He knows I'm going to go out there and work hard, ask questions. And I'm not exactly sure how the offense will work yet. I'm sure he will bring some things from Buffalo, which will obviously help me. Just a familiarity of uh, him and Bubba knowing what I bring to the table. I, I know I'll be a great locker room guy. I'm going to be a great teammate, and uh, that's – more important than honestly being a great player sometimes. How helpful was that as you made this decision, knowing that you're like, oh yeah, okay, I know Bubba, I know Ken, they know who I am as a guy. Uh, why was that so important for you? I mean, I think it was really great just to, you know, have familiarity, but I think the thing with me was really when I met the other guys, when I met uh, Kevin and AB and I've known Deuce. Uh, Deuce was actually uh, my pro, he actually did my pro day 
when he was in Philly and I've had some familiarity with him. The other three guys I don't know, I have a really good feeling about them and I have confidence in them. And uh, my job is to get here and work hard so they have confidence in me. What was that meeting like with Deuce for the first time? Oh, it's cool. Actually, uh, you know, my dad's always asked about him. My dad spoke highly of him. He talked to my dad for probably two or three hours at the pro day. So uh, my dad was excited. And uh, he, honestly, when I first met him, I, he's obviously never my coach, but he's what I thought he was. We talked about ball. Uh, he's really a really family guy. He treats you like family. So uh, I'm really excited to work with him and uh, always kind of wanted him to coach me. So I'm, I'm excited it really kind of happened. When you look at this Browns team as a whole, and specifically on the offensive side, what excites you about what you guys could do you know, this upcoming season? Well, I mean, there's pieces here. I mean, we have we have a good run game, Chubb, obviously. Uh, I played against Deshaun for like 10 years now, playing against him in college for two years and playing against him for five years in Indy. And then, I mean, you good quarterback, great team. You got Amari Cooper out wide. We just got Jerry Judy, Joku. Like, we have pieces here. Off the field, what do you want Browns fans to know about you? One, I have a twin sister. Y'all mm -hmm. will see her. Um, two, I'm the national spokesperson of the Muscular Dystrophy Association. It's my fourth year going. Uh, my mom has limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Um, everywhere I've been, I've met families certain places and had a ticket block community, had met, met fans at games. So I'm excited to meet the fans with the MDA. I think the last thing is I love music. So uh, y'all, the fans will probably see me playing my guitar on Instagram, playing the drums, uh, playing rock bands. So uh, that's really my three things. Okay, let's break those down because those are all really, really cool things. <laughs> so first music, how did you get into um, guitar, into all of those? All of those. I was in the band in middle school and high school, played the saxophone. Don't really pick up any of those much more. Played the drums when I was younger. My uncle taught me and been playing the drums ever since I was younger. And then uh, since my surgery, I've always wanted to learn how to play guitar. So I got some lessons and just went for it. So I uh, can play some Paramore songs, can play some of my favorite songs on the drums and, and uh, the guitar. That's awesome. Okay, going back to um, being a spokesperson and your mom, obviously that's incredibly important to you, but what made you want to become a spokesperson and really just dive into, um, into that aspect? Genuinely speaking, I really never knew anybody who went through it in high school or college, so it's kind of hard to go through things and you don't have, like you, all your friends, parents are healthy, they're, all, they're at all the games. Going on to the league, I started a, the Heinz Heroes ticket block, so I used to pay for like 10, like, uh, 10 people, it was like two or three families, pay for their seats, meal, I'd meet them, I'd meet them every, every Sunday at 10.30 at home games. And from that work, it just became the national spokesperson of the Muscular Dystrophy Association. I'm so gracious because I've met so many families in the past seven years that are going through something that I've went through. And my, the first 21 years of my life, I didn't know anybody. So having family like the McGlynn's in Indy or, P, or the, the Shinnemans in uh, Indy as well, just they're still calling me, texting me. I still get updates on my man Jordan. Just seeing people progress and not giving up hope has been really big to me. Well, it's really, really great to get to know you and get to meet you, and welcome to Cleveland. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be at the Dog Pound. All right, that's Naheem Hines, our new running back, sitting down with our own Kelsey Russo. We'll take a quick time out when we come back. A little draft talk with Dane Brugler. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Bally Bet on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Welcome back to Cleveland Browns Daily. I'm Jason Gibbs on this holiday edition of Cleveland Browns Daily. Time to talk a little draft right now. We are a month away. Uh, A month from now, actually, it'll be over. The draft, uh, the 25th, 26th, and 27th of April, originating in Detroit, Michigan this year, right up the road. For more on the NFL draft, here's Dane Brugler with our own Nathan Zagura. Welcome back to the Combine. Time for one of the treats of our trip to Indianapolis every single year as we are joined by the draft guru of the athletic, the author of The Beast, the the greatest draft guide in human history, <laughs> Dane Brugler, at Twitter, on Twitter, at DP Brugler. I just found out what the P stood for. Paul, I remember uh-huh. that. Uh-huh. So what a, what a day. We're off to a great start already. <laughs> How you doing, man? This is this is like for you. I feel like this is like you're coming to Disneyland. Oh yeah, no, this is something. It, there's so much to gain from this week, and God, we've been doing this for how long now? I mean, a long time. A dozen years ago, I think yes. maybe it's probably the first time we we sat down here at the combine and talked. Uh, but yeah, this is such a such a important week to the process. Um, it's not just about the 40s and what you learn on the field, but uh, the interview stuff behind the scenes. You it's learn more talk. at night here. Yeah. Um, a lot of things going on. You know, teams are scouts are fresh out of meetings, uh, the pre-draft meetings. So maybe kind of figuring out where some of these teams, uh, maybe they're not interested at all in a player. Maybe they're high on a player. Um, it's it's interesting to match that up with your preconceived understanding of of the prospect. So uh, yeah, this is a big week. All right, where's the what stage is the beast like written? And you just have to fill in some things from the combine, or I where wish. are we at? Oh. Uh, yeah, I don't. Don't even tell me how many more days are left until the draft because it just gives me anxiety. Uh, oh, you got plenty. It's the end of yeah. April. You're safe. No, the, yeah, like two months. The month of March doesn't happen for me because yeah. it's just, yeah, it's trying to finish it. There's probably 200 p- profiles just done. You know, they're ready to go. It's just, yeah, add in the pro day information, combine information, ready to go. Um, but then there's another 200 I want to go. Um, and that's figuring out, okay, who are the last 100 that get full profiles and then the other 100 that are more abbreviated because every year you know sure. we have 320 players here and so but i want to get at least 400 so who are the 80 player next 80 players i need to do um every year there's about 35 non-combine guys drafted making sure those guys are in the draft guide um hasn't hasn't been since i think 2000 or, uh, yeah, 2016 the last time a player was drafted who wasn't in the beast so got to keep that uh, okay, keep that keep going, going yeah. Gibbe's knocking on wood for you I like that <laughs> so to find those guys is that based on your relationships with scouts 100%. from around league because they're like yeah. we're talking about this guy that the teams are drafting the guys you know no matter how much I like a kid from Mount Union you know it doesn't really matter it's who are the teams looking at who are they uh, maybe interested in that not really a lot of people are talking about yeah. um and it, maybe it's because of uh they come from a small school sure maybe it's because they were just something about their profile is not matching up maybe they just don't have a lot of snaps they were backup whatever it may be uh but that's why i have a ton of respect for the area scouts uh around the league they're on the ground they're figuring this all these guys out uh, all the information they get is so valuable to the end process. Um, and so trying to figure that out is, is definitely a key part of what I do. All right, so you're coming here. What's your favorite thing about the Combine? Is it is it the late nights when you're just out and about in the mix here getting information? Besides talking with you guys, I mean, well, it's uh, – That was a gi- – I didn't want to – Yeah, <laughs> that, that was a given, right? Yeah. Uh, What's the best steak I get? I don't, you know, maybe that's uh, that's next. You gotta have a steak. What is your what would what's your number one steak? Uh, it's in gotta time? be the cowboy ribeye from St. Elmo's. Of course. Uh, you know, you can't go wrong. It's it's just it's they know what they're doing over there. Yes, put it, it is that a, way. They uh, got it down to a science. Even the bread's amazing. Uh, it's, it's so good. But uh, right, do you handle the shrimp cocktail? I'm not a, a shrimp guy, so it's yeah, it's it's not for me. But I stick to the steak and the green beans sure, and sure. the bread, and it's just fantastic yeah uh but I, you know football related i think it's it really is uh, getting a chance to uh understand where teams are in their process um because again after after the all-star season's done shrine game senior bowl all the scouts they go back to headquarters and they have preliminary draft meetings and that's where they all sit down and they go over these players and the room has a, an opinion about the player. The area scout has an opinion. The GM has an opinion. And you build your preliminary draft board and getting a better sense for what that preliminary draft board 
looks like and feels like uh, from team to team is really fascinating because I think people would be really surprised how. I was just going to say, how different are they? Yeah, very different. And, you know, it's we need to remember, too, there are 320 players here. Draft boards around the league are 150 names. You know, a lot of guys just aren't a fit culture-wise or scheme-wise. And so understanding who specifically teams are looking at is, is a key part of this, too. And a lot of that happens here at the Combine. Hey, you know, I know the 40-yard dash, it, it, that stuff, I care. You know, I, I, It's checking a box. Yeah, it's more confirmation, right? It, like, it's a cross-checking exercise. Yeah. It's making, hey, this guy's fast on film. Okay, he's fast in shorts and a T-shirt here at the Combine. Um, there will be surprises, obviously. Guys run faster than you think or maybe don't perform up to the level, and you have to – Go back and figure it out. Maybe he's just not a great tester, you know. Maybe the maybe the tape you watched on him in October, he had a hamstring injury. You know, there's so many different factors here with these guys. And it's, so it's all about, as a scout, you have to be part investigator. You have to be part psychologist. You have to be, there's so many aspects of uh, being a really good scout. And uh, here at the Combine helps fill in a lot of those spots. Marvin Harrison is your, and maybe he's not, but if I'm assuming he's your number one receiver this year. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is he your highest graded receiver since who? Uh, probably Julio Jones, I think. Okay. Um, I think. I, it, <laughs> okay, so that's a, whole, that's a while. He's got a very similar grade as Jamar Chase did coming out. So uh, Jamar Chase would be the name that it's like, okay, the very similar grades. But, but then before that, we're talking, yeah, Julio Jones. Before that, we're talking Calvin Johnson. I mean – the best receivers that have come out generational absolutely um it's just there's you can nitpick him but what are the weaknesses you know like what what are the things that are going to hold him back yeah and honestly i would throw malik neighbors in there as well i think there's a like razor thin gap between harrison and, and malik neighbors both so these guys are so if you're in the top 10 and wanted a receiver you're, this is a good draft for you uh, you better be in the top six because i don't okay. know if they're if it th- just put roma dunze in there yep. as well from washington if you want one of these guys, you probably need to be picking in the top seven to make sure you get him. If I'm say like I'm the Bears at nine, and I'm gonna take Caleb at one, and then I would love to get one of these receivers to pair with DJ Moore on the outside and really make my offense the best it can be. I don't think I'm gonna get one at nine, so I'm making calls. See what, what would it cost for me to go up to seven to make sure I get one of these guys? Because you look at it, quarterbacks are gonna go one, two, three, most likely. Yep. Whether the Patriots pick third or they trade out of there, yep. I think quarterbacks go one, two, three. Cardinals, Marvin, Marvin Harrison Jr. probably. Yep. Five's really interesting. I think the Chargers want out of there. You know, they would love – Jim Harbaugh wants more picks. You know, he wants to really build up his roster and his image. It's kind of the evolution of the league as we talk 100%. here with, with Dane Brugler. And it feels like the top half of the first round, I don't remember it being so offense-heavy yeah. in a long time. I mean, mm-hmm. there isn't that – Miles Garrett, there's certainly nope. not that dominant edge. There's, Are there really corners that you go, okay, we got to have them, or maybe one? I, I think Terry and Arnold from Alabama, yeah. and I'd throw Quinion Mitchell in there too from Toledo. I, I think both those guys are uh, have a chance to be really good starters in, in the NFL. And so it'll be interesting who that first defensive player is off the board, whether that's one of those corners. Is it Dallas Turner from Alabama, who I think probably be the first pass rusher drafted? Yep. Um, I think a, a dark horse is Byron Murphy, the defensive tackle from Texas. He's going to tear it up this week. I mean, he's, he's 300 pounds. He's running the four eights, and he'll be he'll be great. Put up 35 reps on the bench. Um, he's a dark horse to be the first defensive player drafted. But where will that be? Is that going to be 10? Is it going to be 12? You're 100 percent right. This is if you need if this is a if, if you need one of those premium positions, quarterback, tackle wide receiver this is the draft for you if you're picking top 10 all right browns we know no first round pick yeah. again fine last year well not we'll see maybe there's a <laughs> trade in the eye who knows it feels like the last year where we won't have first round pick but first pick is 52 yeah if you're the browns talk to me because you're always very good at this you peg greg newsom from the get-go back uh when we used to have first round picks yeah. where what positions are you really looking at and then who would maybe be a couple of guys in those positions? So I'll start with whatever you think the first position you're looking at maybe in round two. Yeah, you know, it's tough, obviously, because you don't know how those first 50 picks are going to play out. Sure. So you have to let the board fall to you. But I'm convinced that wide receiver is going to be a deep position every year between now and the rest of the time. Yeah, it's just how the best athletes, that's where they're going because they want the ball. And if you're yep. not good enough to be a quarterback and there's only one quarterback in every team, you're going to be playing receiver. And so from – Peewee, the youth football, the seven-on-seven, seven, the high school, to college. So we're entering a golden age. Every year there's going to be studs at receiver. And this year, uh, you know, we already talked about the top three guys. 
Brian Thomas from LSU is going to be somewhere in that first round mix. And then when you get to the second round, a lot of really interesting names. The two Texas kids, Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, both should work out well here this week. Uh, you know, big fan of Roman Wilson from Michigan, what he brings. So I think depending on what you're looking for exactly, what do you? Because if you're drafting a receiver in the second round, you're sacrificing something, right? Yep. Whether that's size, speed, maybe a little raw, uh, not the best route runner. So you know, there's a reason he's not a first round pick. So figuring out for your offense, what are you willing to sacrifice on? to get the best player that's going to help you off. That, that's something the Browns are going to have those conversations. Who's your boy, Uno? Yeah, Malachi. Debo Jr., yeah. Debo I mean, Jr., he's, okay. Before the catch, he's a receiver. After the catch, he's a running back, man. He is He is built. I mean, he looks like a running back. He is jacked. He, he's, uh, But he should run the 4-4s here. He's got speed, too. Uh, he's a lot of fun to watch uh, coming from Western Kentucky because of what – they call him the Yak King. And yep. they, they call him that for a reason, obviously. Um He's a guy that uh, I think, even though he was more of an underneath player in college, he showed at the Senior Bowl. He can track the ball deep. He can be more than that. So, uh, yeah, he's he's definitely in that second-round mix as one of those guys. It, in my uh, top 100 that I came out with uh, last week, he was like 49 or something. So okay. I think right around that range that we're talking about. Who of the receivers that you mentioned or maybe somebody you haven't mentioned yet that like second or even third round that's just – well, we, we need a field stretcher, right? Yeah. We need a, the vertical, take the top off the defense, a burner. Who are some of those names? Troy Franklin's the first one that comes to mind, the Oregon receiver. Uh, I mean, you think about what the Browns prioritize, and he kind of fits a lot of those boxes. He's young. He's going to run really well. Um, he's a more skilled receiver than, say, like an Anthony Schwartz was okay. uh, coming out of Auburn. Uh, but at the same time, again, you're sacrificing something, and you know he's still he's still young in terms of being a more diverse route runner with his route tree. Um, some of the stuff downfield needs to clean up. There's some Christian Watson there, you know, what with, with, with Watson gives to the Packers, who not the most complete receiver. But you want that field stretcher. You want a guy that's going to – defenses have to respect that speed. Yep. And what that does for the rest of your offense, Troy Franklin gives that to you. So I think he is a realistic option if that's the type of receiver they want to go in the second round. Defensive tackle is a position I feel like they're going to have yeah. to address. Right. Anybody in, in that second round that would be – you'd be running to the to the podium to get if they were there, there for the Browns? Yeah, it, I don't think it's – necessarily a deep group uh, in, talk, in terms of interior defensive line, but there are some good names, I think, on day two. Chris Jenkins uh, from Michigan, who, you know, we know what his dad was. Sure. But he's a completely different player. His dad was 360 pounds. Jenkins is probably 295, uh, but he's a really twitched-up player, can rush the passer, can stop the run. Uh, he was a part of a really heavy rotation at Michigan, so the numbers, the production, don't just jump off the page. But when you see him move and, you know, you see how he can play the run, how uh, when he is matched up with uh, single blockers, how he can break him down and uh, create pressure on the pocket, you see a guy that's ascending and getting better and better. So I think Chris Jenkins uh, would make a lot of sense there. Uh, Michael Hall's really interesting, the Ohio State defense tackle, another guy that doesn't necessarily have the body of work you want, but when he's on and he's healthy – Good luck bl- blocking him because he is an explosive guy. So the defensive tackle is not a really deep group, but definitely some names on day two that I think would make sense for this but team. But who was the one that came in, was the number one defensive lineman out of high school? And then uh, – The LSU kid? Yeah. Is that uh, yeah, Mason Smith. Yeah. yeah. Is he good? Yeah, I mean, he's – there was so much hype for him, and then he tore his ACL in the opener last year, 2022, came back this year, and wasn't quite the same guy. I think – Third, fourth round, and the other LSU uh, defensive tackle, Makai Wingo, he's another uh, you know really good player as well. So both the LSU defensive tackles, uh, third round, fourth round, that's the type of range we're talking for them. It's just I can anything. I don't even you, the command you have is just spectacular. It's stunning to watch. Talking of course with the great Dane Brugler. All right. So we talked a little defense tackle. We talked about wide receiver. Mm-hmm. You mentioned it's a deep tackle class. Is that true into like third, fourth round, or is it? Deep in terms of – It's top-heavy. Top-heavy. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I think we're going to see, what, maybe six offensive tackles go top 20, top 22. Yeah. And then uh, maybe a few more even get into that first round. So we might end up with seven or eight offensive tackles first round. Okay. And then a little bit of a drop-off. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, the Yale tackle, Kieran uh, Amageji, but he's a draft-and-develop guy. Like okay. He's not someone that's going to help you on a, on his uh, you know rookie uh, rookie season. 
Um, offensive tackle, Patrick Paul from Houston's another one of those guys who's really long, but uh, he, he's available in the second round for a reason probably. Um, it, it's more of a top-heavy position this year. There's some guys you can get third round, fourth round, but not some, it's not going to be a really deep group of uh, tackles at that point. All right, last one, and we appreciate the time. It's day three. You're in the Browns' war room. Mm-hmm. Who is somebody that you are just like, pounding the table for this is the the Dane Brugler gem uh my Yale tackle I think uh you know he's a guy that might sneak into the, the day two because he is so talented uh but yet my Yale left tackle be someone for sure you know Austin Booker uh the pass rusher from Kansas I I, I think the secret's out on him and he might be going second or, or uh, day two now but I think Austin Booker from uh, Kansas is, could be one of those guys. He, I think someone the Browns would be really interested in because he's young. Yeah. He hasn't played a ton of football, but you're you're buying low and just watch the ascension with him. Um, Andrew Phillips from uh, Kentucky. Uh, he's a really scrappy athletic player. Didn't have a ton of ball production in college, but you love the traits. And so I have to sacrifice something with him. Of okay. course. Didn't have the interceptions, but you know what? I think he's a day one nickel and a guy that's going to you know, make my secondary better. So a lot of, uh, yeah, quiet prospects that I think teams around here are kind of hoping they stay quiet. Well, write those down, folks. The great Dane Brugler. We're going to get the beast. Okay, you got to subscribe to The Athletic. You get it as a part of your subscription. That's, that's it. the best deal that there is. When when can we expect the beast, roughly? Uh, first week in April is always the goal because you want to get okay. all the pro day information in there. Uh, and th- those run through all the way through March. Um, but, yeah, somewhere in that first week in April. But, yeah, if you're if you're a fan of the draft at all in any capacity, y- this is a must-have for you. It's so, a must-have yeah. because your team's going to draft somebody you could immediately go and yeah. become an expert on them you, and understand find exactly out, why. Yeah, what's his older brother's name? Yep. What's his uh, – where did he grow up? What, how many sacks did he have as a freshman and all that stuff? True story. This is true. I don't know if I've told you this before, but your guide always helps me. So I'm the first person that when we draft somebody uh-huh. they talk to, your guide always helps me I love it. get a personal anecdote in there <laughs> that they then can relate to because right. it is that thorough. You yeah. are, you've got it all. So you're, you're a master. At DP Brugler on Twitter, the great Dane Brugler. Thanks so much, man. Anytime. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right, we got one minute left to go here on this Friday Uno. Riff fun fact of the day since I screwed him over yesterday. Since 1994, Duke has made seven Final Four appearances and won three national championships. Yeah, they have. But it's been 30 years since Duke has beaten a higher seed in March Madness. They're 0-5 when they're facing teams with a higher seed. The last time they did it was 1994 against the Purdue Boilermakers. They have a chance to right that wrong tonight against Houston. Four and a half point underdogs. Let's go, dogs. Devils! Let's go! Take care of business. Hopefully I'll get to watch some of it as That's well. my squad too, Gibbs. Oh, Arnold. Yeah. Oh, hey, go Cougs, I've, got, but... I've got some stories, buddy. I've got some stories. Got to travel with him and everything else. So, uh, Uno, have a great Easter. Griff, have a great Easter. Kevin Arnold, I can't see you. Have a great Easter. I hope everybody has a great Easter as well. Bishop and Zagura back with you on Monday. The next level is indeed next. I'm Jason Gibbs. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by Ballybet now live in Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland.